um, a lot of people um, are talking about that there will be a before and an after coronavirus. But also a lot of people are saying, I, you know, I can't wait to go back to normal. But I know the Tri-Continental Institute um, has just written a, uh, a newsletter where the title was, we won't go back to normal because normal was the problem. Can you, um, can you tell us what you meant by that? You see, a pandemic is an occasion to think about how society is structured. Um, the pandemic itself is not the problem. I mean, of course, it's going to kill people. It has killed friends of mine. It's a very cruel virus. I recognize that. But the pandemic has also, in a sense, showed the weaknesses of the system. You know, if you take a ship, a wooden ship, into the ocean, and if the wooden ship is made of timber, which is rotten, that ship will sink immediately. Now, if you have a ship that has good timber, it could also sink. You know, the ocean is a very powerful thing. In the same way, this virus is very powerful. But we have come to this virus on a ship with rotten timber. And I think that this is really the question we have to ask ourselves, not about the virus itself. You know, eventually the virus will kill a large number of people. Vaccine will be found. Eventually we may get past the virus. But will we get past the problems that the virus has identified? And I think that's where human beings must look, you know. And what were some of those problems? I mean, it's impossible to look at that phrase, flatten the curve. You know, it initially comes in the United States Center for Disease Control report from 2007. It initially was flatten the epidemic, epidemic curve. Then somebody cleverly said, flatten the curve. What does flatten the curve mean? At one level, it's common sense. You know, you don't want everybody to get sick at the same time. Let's stagger the sickness. That's what it means, essentially. Because you don't want to overrun hospitals. Now, I recognize that it is not possible to build any social order where there's a hospital bed and a ventilator for everybody in the planet. You know, 7 billion intensive care beds, 7. I understand that. Nobody is saying that. But between an uh, intensive care bed and a ventilator for everybody and the situation where we barely have enough beds for people getting sick and, and almost no ventilators, the gap between that is actually a statement about the rotten social order, the lack of actually a civilization. You know, the very fact that we need to flatten the curve urgently so that we don't have to make rationing choices about who gets to live and who gets to die shows the system was not prepared. You know, when you take something like healthcare and you say, let's make healthcare about profit, then every bed in a hospital is effectively like real estate. You know, you cannot allow the bed to be empty. You know, a landlord doesn't want any apartment to ever be empty. They want apartments to be 100% occupancy. Hotels want every room 100% occupancy. You don't want an empty room. An empty room, essentially, is an asset that you are not monetizing. You're not making money off the asset. If you treat hospital beds like an asset that you need to monetize, you don't want to have too many beds. You want to have leaner hospitals. You don't want to have too many nurses. You want to have few nurses. You, know, you want to cut the fat so that your profit is increased. If this is your attitude to healthcare, when the tsunami comes of, you know, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, when that strikes, you have none of what we call surge capacity. You have no way to expand the accordion, you know, let, um, you know, new beds open up and so on. It becomes immediately a crisis. I can understand toward the end of a pandemic, a crisis emerges, you know, as more and more. But how come it's a crisis on the third day. You know, in New York City, it was a crisis on the third day. I mean, you don't have enough intensive care units. You don't have ventilators. You don't have this. You don't, you don't have masks. You don't have protective equipment. This is the scandal. This is not a scandal about SARS-CoV-2. This is a scandal about our civilization. It's not just health. It's education. You know, you've got an education system 
where you're cutting and cutting and cutting and you have teachers barely able to breathe when they teach. Then you have pressure from the far right producing nonsensical, irrational thinking. So, you know, rumors can fly about and so on. I mean, frankly, and I'm going to end with this, the purpose of the human struggle is to bring reason into the world. Reason doesn't just exist there. You know, I don't believe that here's reason. Now let's immunize people with reason. We struggle to make reason manifest in the world. But this civilization of austerity on healthcare, austerity on education, austerity on everything, you know, has made reason in the world impossible. Uh, it has brutalized people. This is long before the pandemic. The pandemic has shown how broken society is. The pandemic itself has not broken society. When you talk to politicians and you tell them, look, you need to invest more in, in health, their response would be, yeah, but if I invest more in health, I need to take the budget out of education and then the teachers will be unhappy. And then if I invest more in education, I need to take the budget out of this. And then, so where, where do you, would you find the money to, to actually invest in education and et cetera? You know, we looked at the numbers. Uh, this is at the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. We looked at the numbers, available numbers of money in tax havens. Just as an example, I'm giving you an example. I, I have a hundred ways in which you can raise the money, but let's just take this as a good starting point. If you look at the available information on tax havens, whether it's, you know, in the Caribbean or you look in tax havens, Actually, in the jurisdictions of countries, you know, Luxembourg, so on, Maryland, you, know, you just add up all the tax havens. You get this number, $32 trillion. Now, I, you, I don't expect you to know this, but $32 trillion is worth more than the total known amount of gold. That means all the gold in the world, you add it all up, it's infinitely less than $32 trillion. The reason you can't get to that money is, one, it's in tax havens. Two, no country has capital controls that are effective enough. We're just allowing the rich to send their money out of the jurisdiction of taxation. So there is that money. There is the money spent in arms dealing, you know, enormous trillions of dollars spent buying and selling weapons. How much do you need? You know, how many weapons do you really require? Um, you know, there is enormous amount of money in the giant casino wall, you know, the, uh, the uh, stock markets around the world. Enormous casino of money. Uh, banks are just sitting on cash. You know, after 2008, the uh, Federal Reserve of the United States essentially opened the floodgates of liquidity, bringing down interest rates. The Europeans came late to that game. The Federal Reserve just flooded the market with liquidity, with cash. Banks just took the cash and sat on it. They didn't have any productive investment. You know, nobody's going to tax the banks. They move money from one, you know, jurisdiction to the next. You know, this is called, you know, whether it's uh, invoicing in a clever way, you know, uh, mispricing, etc. They do a whole bunch of little tricks. It's kind of alchemy. The money disappears. The government has given you free money. You've taken the free money and banished it. And now you tell me where is the tax money coming from to robustly fund education and health? If a politician says that to me, I would honestly like to slap them. It's disingenuous. They know exactly what they've done. They have allowed the ruling elites to go on a 40 to 50 year tax strike. The ruling elites have been on strike. They have been undertaking a kind of class struggle from above. By withdrawing their money from the social system, essentially, they have boycotted humanity. And you see, then they turn around. See, Frank, this is what I hate. Then they turn around and they donate money. You see, I don't want philanthropy. I would like taxation. Taxation is democratic. Philanthropy is not democratic. Philanthropy is monarchical. Somebody gives money to you know, a hospital, you're meant to pray to them. You have to name the hospital after them. 
Philanthropy is monarchical. Taxation is democratic. There is sufficient productive resources in the world. The problem is that the social structure we have has allowed these resources to be hidden away and not used democratically. That's really, you know, the point. So, so in a way, to change this, because you know where the money is, the politicians do know where the money is, you need political will, right? But we know that with the, the system in place, uh, the capitalist system, the, the political will will never happen. So, because I feel that after, a, after every crisis, most of the people know that there's something very wrong with society and the way it's run, but people don't know how to fix it. And then you sort of forget and you go back to the normal cycle. So I know it's, it's, it's an impossible sort of question to answer, but it looks like it's going to be down to us again, the people, to, do, to change things after, after the COVID-19. How, how could we start, at least, to change things? Well, I mean, it's, it's not the same question anymore, in a way, I feel. I feel like COVID-19 has intensified the battle of ideas. You know, it's now commonplace for people to say that healthcare systems need to be improved. It's commonplace. I, I don't think there'll be a debate. I understand that in Spain, they momentarily nationalized parts of the healthcare system. And I, in France, you know, they've done certain things. People joke. They say in a time of crisis socialism, in a time of non-crisis rapacious capitalism, you know, that's a joke. It's not funny. It's not funny because... It's not socialism in a time of crisis. What it is, is when it's a crisis, you have the people pay the biggest cost. And when it's not a crisis, you allow the ruling elites to enjoy the fruits of it. It's not, a, it's not funny to say socialism in it. It's not socialism. It's that the bill for the crisis is delivered to the homes of ordinary people. This is, I think, being understood right now. In other words, I feel like COVID-19 has accelerated the battle of ideas. We need to be, I think, much more aggressive about saying this truth. There's no need to varnish this truth. It should be raw. The truth is that you have created the social system inadequate to deal with this. Now you are making the ordinary people pick up the bill and the children of ordinary people pick up the bill. Meanwhile, your money in the tax havens, you want to ensure that it maintains at least most of its value. You know, if the stocks collapse, let's infuse billions of dollars immediately. This is a criminal response. You know, we need to intensify the battle of ideas. That's an intellectual argument. But beneath that, political movements have to be developed, supported. You know, uh, they have to also m mature into society. I mean, I have for a long period thought that the left should not feel that it's the left. The left must feel that it is the only authentic way to go forward in society. You know, in other words, I feel that the neoliberals, the whole bourgeois order has basically said there is no future. All you will get is a permanent present. What we have today, friends, this is what's going to be forever. You're having a hard time paying your bills. Your children will have a hard time paying the bills. Their children. Maybe one or two people will be able to take an elevator to the top floor. They are specially talented. They are spotted by somebody. They can sing. They go on some stupid television show. They make a lot of money. One or two. But the bulk of you, the life of struggle you have led, your children will lead. This is what the bourgeois order is saying. The left has to take a much more aggressive position. Not only fighting the bourgeois order. But we need to be out there saying, we don't accept this idea that the future is canceled. There will be no future, only the endless present. No, we believe in a future. See, after the collapse of Soviet Union, many of us on the left felt penalized. We felt that our utopia, as it were, had somehow been silenced. It was not possible for us to come out in public and say, we are for socialism. Now, much more than ever, we need to talk about the future, not about what's wrong with the present. The critique of the present 
is the journey into the future. The critique of the present isn't just a critique of the present. A lot of us have become stuck into the trap of constantly critiquing neoliberalism. I think that is our responsibility. But the critique of the present must open the door to the future. Otherwise, you will just not win society. Society doesn't want to come to a political tendency whose greatest you know, achievement is offering the best critique of the present. So society will come to you. You will hegemonize society when you are able to offer an alternative, a future, not just this bloody endless present. You know, the bourgeois order has actually collapsed. It's finished. It has no answers to the future. That's why I say it. for them, the future is canceled. For us, the future is everything. Because we look at this and say, is this a joke? I mean, 700 million people in India don't know when the next meal is coming from. This is a joke as a, a, of a civilization. You know, the, the Indian government did a lockdown and didn't care about migrant labor. Just said, go home, fellas. People had to walk 1,100 kilometers home. No food, no cash in their hands. You know, it's a, it's a human rights violation. The bourgeois order is a human rights violation. We are the future. That's the attitude. So, yeah, finally, um, we know how governments are going to use this crisis, right? Some people... I think they want to be optimistic. They're saying, oh, I mean, the government, they're not going to be able to go back to how it was before. Um, they won't go back to how it was before. I think they'll go even harder on like pushing our heads down. And I mean, we've seen it already with Orban in Hungary and, and I mean, Trump and Bolsonaro. So the after COVID-19 is going to be even harder, I think, for, 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 for the bulk of the people than the before COVID-19. So how to, as, as, as a movement, as, as people, how do you think we could best support the ones that would need it most uh, in a couple of months or whatever? So I, I'd say two things to that. The first is, of course, that um, I think political movements across the world are quite seized of this problem. Uh, this is not a problem that you and I have to solve. Um, I think political movements, social movements understand this. You know, they are capable of, of knowing this immediately and they will respond. Um, the second thing, very practical thing I want to say is that um, uh, about f just when the lockdowns began, you know, in earnest around the world, um, Tricontinental uh, and the International Assembly of the People which I, I want to just say a few things about, joined together and we basically said, let's produce a declaration. Now, the International Assembly of the Peoples is um, a uh, platform of about 200 organizations, political organizations around the world. You know, for instance, the Communist Party of Nepal, which is in power in, the, in Nepal, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, you know, the Workers' Party of Tunisia. These are big political organizations. So about 200 political organizations spread out over almost 100 countries. That's the International Assembly of the People. And so our research institute and the International Assembly of the People joined together and we produced a 16-point declaration, which people can see at our website, thetricontinental.org. And we've asked people to endorse the declaration. It's not just a declaration in word. You see, that declaration, if you go to different countries, the shack dwellers movement in South Africa, uh, Abakhali based Majondolo, has created their own version of that set of demands specific to the shack dweller movement. So, you know, we hope that we put together a vision, you see, not just principles, but an actual vision, which will then get deeper into people's Sorry, struggles. Sorry. Could you please... Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, technology. Uh, um, the point is that, you see, you have to have, what do we say in politics? There's no point having a spear. You have to sharpen the spear. The sharpening happens in two directions. It happens in the experience of struggle and the reflection on struggle. You know, that is to say practice and theory. 
You have to have the experience of struggle, then you have to reflect on the struggle. You have to develop a new theory. Then experience, test it, reflect. That is the reason why we produce this 16-point declaration. On the one side, it's for the battle of ideas. We want to go out there and say, there's an alternative. You know, uh, we don't want rents to be suspended. You know, because suspension of rent means household rent or mortgages. It means you're going to have to pay for it after COVID has ended. No, we want landlords to bear the cost of COVID. We want the state to bear the cost of COVID. We want them to put a wealth tax against the wealthy to fund it and so on. You see, these are practical suggestions. They come from principles. They come from the experience of struggle. So I, I don't feel at this point, even though I'm seeing my friends fall ill and some of them die, I don't feel that we are disarmed. I feel like we live on a planet with a lot of political movements, you know, the ones I named and, you know, 197 others, um, lots of political movements around the world. You know, in France, there's a left tendency that, you know, is out there in electoral politics, out there on the street. In Italy, there's, you know, Platforms were created, power to the people, this, that. Let people be there struggling for an alternative future. I don't look at this despondently. This is merely another chapter in the hideousness of the human experience. But the hideousness of the human experience has another side. And that other side is our capacity to struggle to be decent. You know, let's not get bogged down in the hideousness. You have to dialectically remember we have the capacity as sensitive people to struggle for something decent. That's what we've got to live for. Don't get bogged down in isolation. You have to live with social solidarity.